You are listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast, where we look to educate and entertain the endurance racing community through discussions with racing professionals and elite age groupers. In today's episode, I speak with 2016 Ironman 70.3 world champion Tim Reed. We talk about that race and others. I hope you enjoy. Tim, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Yeah, really well. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So why don't we start off with just uh, learning a little bit about your athletic background and how you got into triathlon? Uh, I guess it wasn't um, your typical professional triathlete background. I played a lot of different sports at a reasonable level, but nothing, you know, not at an elite level, that's for sure. You know, when I was finishing school, I was getting, uh, you know, starting to get into a bit of an unhealthy lifestyle and started jogging a little bit and um, actually jumped into you know, some running and triathlon races just to stay fit and uh, gradually worked my way up the the ladder in the age group ranks. Uh, it was never, there was never sort of a defining moment where I was like, oh yeah, triathlons, this is it, this is what I'm going to do for work. It was just sort of, I just always had the goal to improve and, and it gradually got to a level where I was like, man, I could actually do this for, make a little bit of money. So I took a year off work and Tried, tried it as a professional, and uh, yeah, seven years later, I'm still going. <laughs> very cool, very cool. So I noticed on your results that you had, a, a, I think, a second place in Kona as an amateur age grouper. I mean, talk about that experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's one of my proudest results, actually. You know, there's, I think in the age group ranks now, you know, to win your age group in Kona, you're pretty much living, well, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but a lot of the guys are either working only a few days a week or or pretty much training full time for a block going into Kona. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a result I got actually genuinely working full time, very limited time to train and and um I was working with Grant Giles from Aramax uh at the time and we we just created a good program that really was based off probably 10 to 12 hours a week and and got through Kona with a with a pretty solid result. So, yeah, it's one of my it was a really pleasing day. Funnily enough, I, you know, once I tripled the training a few years down the track, I still haven't quite got it right like I felt like I did that day. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's like that. I'm still chasing some of my <laughs> earlier day uh, results. I'm like, man, I, I had that awesome day three years ago. I still, still can't get it back. But uh, that's the nature of racing, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's so, what keeps us going. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, before I, I want to talk about some of your, you know, obviously your professional races and things. But before we get there, um, you know, I'm I'm based in New York City. I, I've been to Australia. I was there actually on my honeymoon. So, you know, I was there on vacation. Never raced there though. So I'm just curious. You know, what is the triathlon scene there in Australia? I mean, it, it's obviously produced some amazing top elite pros, including yourself. And I'm just curious to kind of understand how it is. You know, at the amateur ranks and professional, is it is it really a no big sport over there? Um, I think it, it it used to be bigger. I think the 90s was a real uh, golden time for triathlon in Australia. We had a lot like the Super Leagues uh, or Island House style of racing. That was on our TVs every Saturday or Sunday. Um, oh, that's cool. With this national national series that just sort of, it was a really fun, fast, uh, exciting format of triathlon. And I know that was my first idea of what triathlon was. And, and for so many guys in my age group, they were the same feel like the younger generations have sort of missed out on that so they didn't there's probably not the depth uh we were sort of i think my age group was sort of the last wave that were inspired by that style of racing and interested in one day doing triathlon and so maybe there's not the depth in the um in the youth as there once was but i know i feel like triathlon australia is heading in the right direction and and working well to promote you know more kids getting into the sport but i it, it's still it's a popular sport. I mean, we've got perfect weather for year-round training. You know, Australians grow up swimming, and so it, it's an it's an easy progression for kids to do triathlon. Um, but I, it's probably not as strong as it once was. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I think it's in, really cool if they're focused on trying to get the youngsters in there and and racing. I I started in my mid thirties, and I I really wish I did it when I was younger because it's obviously a long uh, and uh, steep learning curve, and it's hard to pick up later in life. But especially the swimming component, it is a hard sport to pick up later on. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, we've gone down the path of choosing kids that are talented, and then making them almost give up their childhood to chase triathlon. Whereas I think you're better off, countries are better off just creating events and making triathlon fun and then just letting 
letting the cream rise to the crop naturally over time. And, you know, when guys are in their 20s and 30s, that's when they're really giving it everything, putting it all into it. Whereas I feel like for kids, you know, you just got to make it fun and social and, and encourage mass participation. And I, I feel like federations are starting to realise that, that it's not about picking out six kids and, and thrashing them to death. It's about just creating opportunities for triathlon to grow. Yeah, for sure. And you, you have kids. Are you getting them in the pool and uh, water early to, to learn? It's one of those things that really benefits to start early. So is that on the plan? Yeah. <laughs> um, my oldest son is a lot like my wife, very um, stubborn. <laughs> and then, But he's also got my sense of uh, competitiveness. So he, we took him to swim lessons and he just wouldn't do what he was told. And then so he just sort of gave up and went to the – and he taught himself to swim and just does everything. He, he's he's quite good at learning things, provided he's taught himself. So now we just we just give him the opportunity to play at the pool, and he's taught himself three different strokes. And oh wow, um, and he loves it. But you put him into any sort of structure, and he just instantly is not interested. <laughs> but yeah, the, I mean, like I said, like we, we're, it's such a great uh, climate in Australia. We, the, my boys, you know, can swim most of the year and ride. You know, they're riding bikes everywhere and. It's a. I won't be pushing any sort of structured triathlon um, onto my kids. That's for sure. I just if they ended up doing it because that was what they were interested in, um, that'd be cool. But uh, yeah, I'd rather just give them a big background in a lot of different sports and let them enjoy enjoy life. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. That <laughs> sounds like a, a good plan. So in, in terms of races, I you know obviously um, you know this year you podiumed at Ironman Austria. Australia and uh you had a really good blog post on it in terms of your setup with equipment and all that kind of stuff I read through it I thought it was awesome um you know talk about that race how did it go for you I mean how did that how did that day unfold yeah I'm still uh I'm still yet to find the moment to actually do a post-race blog but I will get to it um I think it, for me sometimes I wanting to win a race so much um can actually be my undoing and instead of just focusing what I need to do there and then and worrying about myself, I was pretty concerned with about David Dello. Um, you know, he's a, he's a really good rate, uh, really good athlete, extremely underrated. And, you know, he's top 10 in Kona. He's won, he's been on the podium at regional championships. He's won a few Ironmans. And when we were on the bike, I didn't stick to my plan and I was attacking very early on, um, trying to shake him, which I did, but then he came back to me later on anyway. And on the run, it was the same. I'd, I'd really trained to run a three, 350 per kilometre pace for a marathon. And then David's run out at 330 to 340 for the first 10 or 15K. And I just went with it instead of sticking to my guns. And uh, and he was strong all day. So, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a good result for me. I think we did a lot of things right. The taper was perfect. It's just that sometimes I, I, I still struggle to stick to a plan in Ironman. I, I really love racing other people and get carried away with that. Whereas I probably, I don't know if I could have beaten Dave, but I certainly could have gone faster if I'd stuck to the plan that I'd trained for. Right. And w one thing I noticed on your, your blog post, you talked about having a history of cramping and using hot shot and that kind of thing. I, I also have a history of cramping and I've, uh, I, I did, uh, uh, Iron Man uh, 70.3 St. George recently. It was like 90 degrees and I, I took a hot shot. It kind of helped. So I, I was just curious if you could talk about that a little bit. Just Yeah. So there's, there's obviously a number of, well, many different causes of cramps. And um, the first part for me was uh, getting sort of the electrolyte mix correct um, as a more of a preventative to cramping. And But even when I'd get all that right, especially in Ironman, cramping was still a major issue for me, just overstimulated nerves, just sending the muscles into spasms. And I found hot shot, it just... Yeah, it really seems to calm calm my nerves down and, and settle the cramping. I mean, I, I've never made it through. I never made it through a three point eight kilometer swim at, you know, at threshold or at Ironman race pace um, without having to stop kicking with a kilometer to go because of the cramps in my calves. And as soon as I and with hot shots, I'm finding just, you know, it hasn't completely eliminated, but drastically different. And I can. If I have a cramp, I can now deal with it and get back on track. So right. I'm a huge fan of the product and that's why, you know, sometimes I think, you know, uh, athletes contact, like you sign with a sponsor, 
you know, for financial reasons or whatever else. But as soon as I tried this stuff, I, I was hassling them straight away. I think it took 12 months to get sponsorship because I just I genuinely believed in the product and, and it changed it changed my racing in 2016. I didn't have to race as conservatively. I could really put it all out there and um, not be scared of pulling up short with um, muscle spasms. Right. And and what is your, your approach? I mean, it sounds like you take one before the swim and then are you taking them throughout the race? I and mean, what's the general high level kind of approach with using it so i take one yeah before the swim and then i have about two on the bike typically in a flask just on my top tube and i just keep a little mouthful going in occasionally and then on the run i think i did probably four or five at port macquarie at ironman australia so i just take it as i need on the run but make sure that there's still some in the system i think last year Last year, I made the mistake of only taking one hot shots with me and with 10 kilometers to go. Actually, sorry, with, yeah, 12 or 13 kilometers to go, I started cramping, took the hot shot, and it worked really well for about 25, 30 minutes, and then I had nothing left, and, and the cramps became a real issue after that. So, yeah, I, yeah, I would encourage athletes with a cramping issue to really have have an adequate supply for the run because you you never know how things are going to go. A lot of it a lot of the cramping, I think, can depend on how the bike leg goes. Um, and if you get onto the run <clears throat> with already a bit compromised, it could be a it could be a long day if you don't have anything to deal with uh, with the cramps. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, happened to me in a few half Ironmans where I didn't have a hot shot or I had, I guess, some salt pills, but I got to the run and I just started cramping, you know, nonstop and it kind of ruined the race for me. So now I, in uh, St. George, I carried a hot shot with me as an emergency and my, my legs started to twinge a little bit, like halfway through the run and I took it and then I had no issues after that. So it, it ended up working really yeah. nicely. So it's a, definitely a good insurance policy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, um, and I think it's very dependent on the athlete. Some athletes never have issues, but athletes know if they're prone to cramps. So it's just a, it just, it's just a logical thing to take one. I mean, um, if you haven't tried it, <laughs> you really should be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, everyone I've I've known who everyone I know who I've put onto it has been like, oh man, this, this stuff really works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've tried everything too. So absolutely. So you mentioned also yeah. that your your taper went perfectly. Um, that's sort of especially for amateurs, kind of a tough area because it's a hard balance between too much, too little. Um, probably amateurs tend to do almost not, like too way too little during the week of an Ironman, that kind of thing. I mean, can you just talk about that a little bit? I mean, how has that evolved over time for you? And how did it, you know, now you said with uh, the latest race, it was a really solid taper. I mean, what, how do you define that? Matt Dixon and I sort of were looking at my best races and what, what happened, like what was the taper that made it work? And typically it was because I would actually get sick or something would get in the way of my training and from three weeks out, there'd be a big drop off and then I would, you know, get some more solid training in. And then it was just always a disrupted preparation from what we'd planned. And we're like, why, why, why am I having my best races when I'm, when the, tra- the training's gone, gone to crap. <laughs> so we, <laughs> um, we just worked out that I really need like a three week taper going into big races. And I mean, it doesn't mean I stop training hard. It's just a lot more rest between sessions dropping off. I guess my typical load drops off 30%. Uh, 20% three weeks out, sort of 50% two weeks out, and then I do sort of six to eight hours the week of the race. So it's it's just a long freshening up phase. I, I tend to uh, I tend to get quite fatigued, you know, like everyone, I guess, but I, I don't seem to bounce back like other athletes and uh, freshen up in a five day taper. So that's the that's what we went with uh, this time. I did challenge Melbourne, I think four weeks out, and was pretty dreadful there i was super fatigued and um just stuck in third gear but at the same time i think that was that was what we expected and it was also i think that's sort of perfect for to finish off your ironman block and then start your taper so yeah um yeah so that that's typically what we do now it's actually a three-week process um of freshening up Cool. So let's talk about last year's world championship. I mean, you obviously won it. Huge result. Amazing day. So I guess uh, two questions and then maybe we could dig in more. But one, you mentioned uh, at the Ironman distance, you sometimes tend not to stick to your plan. I'm curious, did you stick to your plan on in the world championship 70.3 last year? And then the second part of the question 
um, really is around. Obviously, the finish was a very, very close run. I would love to kind of hear a little bit about your mental state at that point, knowing, you know, where uh, Sebi was and sort of was he you know, breathing down your neck and just sort of how you stayed mentally focused and strong. And, and you know, I just I can't imagine being in that situation. So I'd, I would love to hear about it. Yeah. Um, like I was saying with Ironman Australia, I think sometimes I get so focused on winning the race that it can take away from my performance. And with that event last year, I'd had a pretty rough run into it. And we, I'd d- definitely done a really good block of training in, in Bend in Oregon, um, quite a long way out from the race. But then the, the four weeks going in were, were pretty messed up. And I thought, oh. So I went in super relaxed. And I was just like, every, anything I get out of this race is a bonus. And the, it was a really simple plan. I just was like, just be at the, be at the front of the race and, and just do the best. It was sort of like a – instead of an attitude of, oh, I have to win or it's failure, it was like I have to, I have to be, give a performance I'm really proud of in terms of effort. And then if that's fifth place or 15th, it doesn't matter as long as I can walk away going, you know, I, I gave yeah. it everything. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I, the swim went great. The bike was just – I just made sure I was right at the front, even the front couple of guys. And then onto the run, it was – you know, I just worked my way up to Sebi and, and was it was a really – there was a point there, you know, where I got excited about winning. And that's actually when I think Sebi was really um, putting the hurt on me and I dropped off because I was tense, I was stressed. I was like, oh, this is, an, you know, this is an opportunity to win. I can't muck it up. And it was only when I went back to that attitude of, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't win, just chill out and run the best 21 you can that he came back to me. And, of course, you know, it's easy to think that that was the mindset that brought – brought me back into the race but it could also have been that Sebi (laughs) Sebi um was just slowing down so we'll never know but it sounds better if I um if I put it the the way that I just went back to a Mark Allen style sort of mental attitude um (laughs) but yeah and it was uh I mean it was yeah it was an incredible day I was very fortunate I don't I think people you can never underestimate how much a, a home crowd gives you an advantage like the, I mean, Sebi gets a lot of support wherever he goes because he's, you know, he's a star. But I was getting so much support out there, and instead of instead of giving up, it was just like, you know, it was just such a lift to have thousands of people screaming at you. So I feel like that gave me an extra five percent. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, as as you were coming into that finish, and he, I I forgot how close the finish was, but it was only a few, I mean, few seconds, right? I mean, so. Like, had it? Did you have any any doubts or any concerns about the body breaking down, or you just, or is the crowd just sort of, you know, getting you going? You saw the finish line, you're just like, I, and just pushing as hard as possible, redlining it, and hoping for the best. I just, uh, you know, you rarely see finishes that close, so it's, it was so exciting. I'd learned, to, I did Vineman seventy point three maybe six or eight weeks prior, and I was really fit and firing, and it was Andy Potts, Crowey, Sam Appleton, ah. Uh, Terenzo was with us right it was a really close race and I was the aggressor just like Sebi was at 70.3 was I just kept hitting him with attack after attack the problem was I did it way too often way too early and I remember with 2k to go or probably yeah probably 2k to go I put in my final surge got free of everyone and then was completely gone and Andy Potts just zoomed past me and got the win and I was like so at 70.3 worlds I knew Sebi had almost done the same approach that I had done at Fine Man. He just kept attacking, boom, 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 and I was like, and uh, and I knew from the first lap that every time we'd gone downhill, I was moving away from him quite comfortably. But every time we went uphill, he was the stronger athlete. So when we got to the final hill, and I'd, I'd bridge back to him at a k or a kilometer two or earlier, so was, I just thought if I can stay with him on this uphill, I know I've got the leg speed to go down. And when I tried to go, and then I felt so good even on the uphill, I tried to go past him. And he moved across and blocked my path. And I was like, yes, he's panicking. He's gone. <laughs> and so I got a lot of confidence more out of his um, defensive moves on the uphill. Yeah. And so, you know, when we got to that crest, I went around him and I, 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 you know, I looked back a couple of times and he actually came. I went really early and he actually came back to me. But I, yeah, I was quite confident that on the downhill I could hold him off because of all the, all the surges that he'd done throughout the race. 
Yeah, I love the uh, mental games and the chess, uh, mental chess that goes on in these uh, in these races. Sometimes that people don't realize, but you know, it's it's, it's that was that's really cool to hear about. So, um, before you mentioned uh, your coach Matt Dixon, um, how did you get hooked up with Matt, and you know how is that kind of uh, you know relationship working for you in terms of like why is he the coach that works best with you from a fit perspective? And yeah, um, 2011, I went over. Uh, sorry, 2012. So it was my second year as a pro. My wife and son was four months old, and we went to San Francisco to train because oh, actually, I went there just to do four races and. Um, we went there because my um, sister's brother was living there, so it was just easy for her to have family around. And yeah, I, I'd, I'd actually just read Rasmus Henning's book, and I thought, oh, this coach interests me a lot. You know, a bit of a different style, di- different take on things. And so I went and met up with Matt um, while I was there and had a chat, and he basically told me that he couldn't take me on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I just hassled him for a year later. Um, probably a year after that and then he finally took me on in 2013 and um you know it was a really good it it took me a long while to sort of hand it over and give him the trust in the first couple of years it was you know it was very much Matt dictating things and and me just learning to sort of let go and and trust him and then um and then the last few years we sort of progressed into like a um I would get a lot more input into the program and we Matt Matt is really good at He's a good listener. He's also very good at identifying things that work for each individual athlete. So, you know, there's no Matt Dixon style. It's just Matt Dixon style for each athlete, if that makes sense. And we we found a really good formula that seems to work for me, definitely for 70.3s. I think we're still finding our feet in Ironman. But I, I like Matt because it's he's he's willing to let me try my own ideas and, and often – Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, but he sort of sees that as part of the learning process. And then we, you know, we go back and brainstorm and try and sort out what went right and what went wrong and, and move ahead from there. So, I th- you know, I think it's a good mix purely because he's, he's very open um, to me having a lot of input. He's not, he's not a dictator-like coach, which I don't think works particularly well with male athletes. So I, I, I read somewhere, um, I don't know where I read it, it might have been on your blog or it might have been somewhere else, but you know, I was doing some research and it said uh, your favorite workout was a 500 meter recovery swim. So I couldn't agree with you more. That's my favorite workout too, but um, all, all kidding aside, <laughs> but um, you know, what, what would be like one of your, you know, big favorite kind of workouts that, you know, you look forward to um, either, you know, I don't know, a couple of times a season as you're peaking or just something you, you kind of, uh, you know, just you know, kind of validate your fitness or just to enjoy? Yeah, I guess um, I was thinking about this and, and to put a little twist on your question, I guess it's if it's really your favorite sort of training, would you do it if you weren't a professional triathlete? And I was thinking about what I would do if I was no longer being paid to do it. And um, there's a certain sessions that I think I'd still do for the rest of my life. Like I love just getting on the road bike and doing like a huge exploration loop of like five or six hours to – to a destination, you know, get lunch, ride home. I don't like doing it too often, but something really, it's, it's a great thing and I, I would love to do it even when I've stopped racing. And the other thing that I really love is just just getting out in the trails running. I mean, the, they're probably the two, two uh, yeah, sessions that I really enjoy. Um, in terms of a, a validation session for, to know I'm really fit, I did – before Ironman last year, and I, I sort of didn't quite do it this year, <laughs> but it was it was a pretty solid simulation of th- uh, th- three hour ride, and I think there was it was two hours of ab- uh, slightly above Ironman pace intervals on the bike, getting off, and then just running thirty kilometers at race pace. And it's a brutal session, but it's the real. If you want to find out if your nutrition really works, if you want to find out whether you've conditioned your muscles enough for the session or if your bike position's not not quite right and that's the i think that's a a really good one off session to do um maybe four or five weeks out from an ironman right yeah no that sounds like uh, definitely a tough one so I guess um, one final uh, question, since we're almost out of time here, is just kind of talk through the rest of 2017 for me, and ter- you know, in terms of what else do you have on on the plate? What are some of your kind of goals, or or what do you what are you kind of focused on? It's been a bit of a mixed bag this year so far. I mean, the year started off really well. I had an uninterrupted five weeks of training and won Australian champs, and then 
from there it was it was just a whole lot going on i had to, we were away from my sister's wedding and um so the next couple of 70.3s uh we're not we're not awesome but um you know it, it is what it is I, I knew the rest of the year would be pretty focused and structured so i wasn't overly concerned um so from here i basically go into just straight Ironman 70.3 training for my next two races, which is uh, Coeur Lane 70.3 and Racine. And it'll be really nice to go back to that because I feel like 70.3 training is much closer to Olympic distance training than Ironman training. And uh, it'll just be good to go back working on, you know, top end speed. And and, and so that, that'll be my next focus races. And, and after that, we start the prep for Kona um, while trying to – not get too slow for 70.3 worlds <laughs> but yeah oh and also Cebu 70.3 is in there as well but um it's all part of the, the i guess we start training pretty serious for um kona from mid-july well that sounds like a heck of a rest of the season i'm definitely going to be uh tracking and and rooting for you uh for sure so it, it definitely is uh exciting and uh, obviously kona will be, always is a very exciting end of uh <laughs> of a season in terms of a capstone so i hope it goes really well for you and you know tim thank you so much for your time today really appreciate it it's really interesting to hear about your you know racing background and some of the tips and things and i'm definitely going to uh start using hotshot more because that's been a been a battle of mine for a long time so i appreciate you <laughs> enlightening me but <laughs> oh, i'm glad <laughs> no i'm glad glad that you're using it yeah no it's been a pleasure chatting thanks for listening to the intelligent racer podcast for more information on this and other episodes please visit www.intelligentracer.com. Also, be sure to check us out on social media and please review us on your podcast directory. Join us next time for another edition of The Intelligent Racer.